Welcome back. Uh, glad to have you. We're on, uh, starting on Module 9, the structure of investment companies, down at the bottom of page 12. And uh, so, uh, again, one of the things that we've talked about is that uh, you won't really have uh, uh, as many questions on the individual securities, but you've got to know how those individual securities work in order to know how the investment companies are going to act. So that's why we spend so much time on those and why it's so important to know that. But now we get into the, like I said, the structure of investment companies and uh, uh, again, it's, it's very important to understand this because you'll need to be able to, uh, to know what's appropriate, how they work, and what to expect. So there's several different types of investment companies. Uh, the, the first is a face amount certificate company that issues face amount certificates. These things are obsolete. Uh, it, it used to be when mortgages did not fully amortize that this gave the homeowner a tax advantaged way to basically save up to pay off the face amount of the mortgage. So now though what we do is we pay a little bit of principal, a whole lot of interest, and gradually that reverses itself. What they would do then is pay a regular amount of interest and make a regular uh, contribution and then have the face amount of the mortgage when the mortgage came due, when it matured. I say obsolete, that's what they are, it's a valid term, it's an investment company. Unit investment trusts. And let's read this one backwards, okay? A trust is basically a shoebox. Well, what's in the shoebox? Different investments. And you know what? We split that thing up, and a, an, a, an investor owns one unit of the whole shoebox. That's it. Mm -hmm. Then you have uh, in management companies. They're open-end and closed-end. Management companies, uh, the open-end companies, are mutual funds. Closed-end companies are sometimes called publicly traded funds, and there are a couple of different varieties of those. But, uh, but the thing about it is that sometimes you'll hear the term a closed-end mutual fund. There's no such thing. Okay, So just know that the person is using it wrongly. On the test, they'll use it correctly. If you see the word mutual fund, you can assume that it's open-end, because that's all the, that's the only thing a mutual fund is, is an open-end management company. Okay. Uh, unit investment trusts, they have a, uh, a fixed portfolio of securities. I say typically of bonds, but really uh, it's just that it's easiest to explain with bonds. You can have, you can have anything in it you want. Okay. And basically here's how it works. Okay. Is that, like I say, we get this big bag of money and we buy different bonds with it. And then the investor holds shares of beneficial interest. Don't ask me why they call them that. However, I think it was a scathingly brilliant idea to call them shares of beneficial interest. Okay. Anyway, what happens? These things are going to pay interest every six months and then eventually pay off their principal, right? So, uh, so the investor really would like uh, a, a regular monthly check because these things are going to pay all through the calendar. But the, the, the monthly checks are not going to be the same amount. So the sponsor of the fund will take all those interest checks and basically put them into a bucket and they'll normalize that out. Now this will go up and down uh, month to month depending on how many of these things pay. But the investor will get, just again for convenience sake, a, a, a fixed check every month. Now, the thing is that this bond gets called for redemption. The sponsor of this thing does no management work. They'll supervise, but they won't manage. So what happens is that they'll take principal dollars and pro rata, they'll just distribute those out, and now the value of the whole thing goes down by that much. That one's called, this one matures, same thing, and one by one, these things just pay off. Okay. Oh, 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 let's see, in our supervision of the thing, we see that this is some, uh, it's a unit trust that only invests in investment grade bonds. Oh, but this guy right here, his credit quality has slipped, and now he's gone down to a BA. Remember, that's now junk. We can't have junk in here. Whoops, we kind of drifted away. But, but, uh, but what we'll do is that the, the, the sponsor of the thing, not the manager, but the sponsor will choose to sell this one out. Boom. That's about the only management you get. Okay. In fact, 
Some of these you're going to find in the real world, they'll offer reinvestment, but it's not reinvestment into here. What they do is they, they have, it's kind of like a motorcycle on a sidecar. Okay, the motorcycle will generate your money, you reinvest into the sidecar, and then when you build up to $1,000, you buy one of these. Okay, so some of them have $100. It's like I say, various uh, uh, face amounts and minimums and what have you. But that's a unit investment trust, and eventually what's going to happen is you're going to have X's in all those boxes and the thing just self-liquidates. Uh, you can have stocks, you can have a blend of stocks and bonds, you know, really put anything in there you want to. Just, it illustrates the best with bonds. Now, the, the, uh, the most important thing about a unit investment trust is that there is no management. If there's no management, there's no management fee. If there were a management fee, we wouldn't have anybody to pay it to because nobody's doing any management. They are redeemable. Now remember, that means they're non-negotiable. That means you can cash them in. However, the sponsor may choose to make a secondary market in those units. Just keep it in mind. If your company allows you to sell a unit investment trust, check it out with your sponsor. Okay? Because in some cases, it's better to actually buy from the sponsor in the secondary market. But for test purposes, and that's what we're here for, they're redeemable. But sometimes the sponsor will choose to maintain a secondary market. And like we said, the units are called shares of beneficial interest. Or, like I say, a scathingly brilliant idea to call them that. Now, management companies, we have open-end and closed-end. Let's look at those open-end company characteristics first. We have a continuous offering of new shares. They never sell used stuff. Never. Always a new certificate that comes out. A prospectus has to be provided to all buyers because a prospectus, remember, under the 33 Act, has to be provided to buyers of new securities. So you always have to have a prospectus. The price is based on, and when you see the word based on, just think of that's the starting point. All right? That's our starting point is the net asset value. Uh, so it's based on the net asset value or NAV, and then the buyer pays a sales charge if there is a sales charge. Redemptions, because we, we can't sell them. Can't sell them. So we got to cash them in. They're non-negotiable. And when we cash them in, that's going to be at the net asset value, period. We'll talk about which net asset value here in a minute. But uh, the redemptions must be made at the net asset value. And ex-dividend dates, again, we're starting to see where all this stuff is starting to blend together. The ex-dividend dates are set by the board of directors or the sponsor. And typically what they're going to say is it's going to be the day after the record date. Because if I'm a shareholder on the date that I subscribe, I'm not, you know, I don't really buy them, I subscribe to a new issue. All right? Yes, you buy them. Okay? But it's easier for me to think in terms of subscribing to a new issue. When I subscribe to it on that day, I become a shareholder of record. Well, then tomorrow is, is the, 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 today's the record date. I'm, I'm there. Tomorrow is too late. So the day after the record date, typically, is what you're going to see as the ex-dividend date. They can be purchased on margin 30 days after the initial public offering, but they're always an initial public offering. So the thing is that what, what this boils down to, you've got to wrap it around the backside and say that, that I can never purchase new shares on margin. What I can do is wait 30 days, and it has collateral value so that I can own it in a margin account. I can run a debit balance against it, Typically, people don't. But after 30 days, I could if I wanted to. And only initial public offering can be sold. Uh, I'm looking at the wrong thing here. Uh, they can only issue, um, uh, only issue common stock to investors. We talked about that. I, I hopped ahead, so uh, pardon me for that. But they can only issue common stock to investors. But like we talked about before, that's what the company gives to you. And they get money, your money in return. What they do with that money is what's in the prospectus. So they can buy bonds, preferred stock. They check the prospectus for that. And, um, and then um, uh, it cannot be purchased on margin at all. Okay. Now, closed-end funds. Closed-end funds, uh, they have a one-time offering of shares because a closed-end fund looks, walks, talks, quacks, just like a stock. Okay. What's the business of this company? Managing customer funds. The prospectus is provided only at the time of the initial public offering. 
because it's only then that it's a new issue. Okay, open-end funds, mutual funds, they're constantly new issues. The price is determined by supply and demand. Supply and demand for what? Not for the stuff that they own. Yeah, that's one of the factors. But it's supply and demand for shares of the investment company itself. Now, let me explain, okay? Way back when, everybody was just convinced that the South Korean economy was the place to be. The place to be, okay? Now, the thing is, I'm going to peg my net asset value right there, okay? The only game in town was the Korea Fund. There was no other way to invest in Korean shares except the Korea Fund. And so people said, I got to be there, I got to be there, I got to be there. These things went up to about a 300, 350, somewhere around through, the, through their percent premium over their net asset value. Now, since we're talking percentages, it doesn't really matter what the absolute value, that's 100% of the net asset value, whatever it is, okay? Well, then we got started getting stuff like uh, uh, the, the Daihatsu. Yeah, let's see, maybe we better kind of rethink this thing. And the Daewoo. Yeah, you know, and, and then there was, you know, like saber rattling up north of the border, and then there was political, and then they had some, and then, the, and then, and then, and the next thing, like, no, I was looking at it, it was like at a 35% discount. Okay? What drove it from here to there? It wasn't the net asset value of what they owned. That was always at 100% of, of, of its value. What drove it there was supply and demand. Big demand. And then people said, uh, maybe not so much. Okay? So those closed-end investment companies, they can actually layer in that additional level of risk. And because they're just like a stock, then you're going to pay a commission when you buy, and you're going to pay a commission when you sell. Because that's what you do on a stock. That's what you do in a closed-end fund. Okay? And it's on the open market sale. You don't redeem them. You don't cash them in. Hmm. No. You take them out to New York Stock Exchange, American Stock Exchange, or a NASDAQ trade. The ex-dividend dates are set by the exchanges because it looks and walks and talks just like a stock. And then you can, in fact, purchase those things on margin. Okay? After 30 days, after the IPO, then it's just, um, you can buy IBM on margin, you can buy a closed-end investment company on margin. Okay? Just no restriction against it. And only an initial public offering can be sold by a Series 6 representative. Now, that may show up. What can you sell? Okay? Well, you could sell face amount certificate companies, except that they're obsolete. You can sell unit investment trusts. You can sell open-end investment companies or mutual funds. You can sell closed-end investment companies on the initial public offering. You cannot sell closed-end investment companies any time after that. So let's figure this one out, okay? Is it a good business practice to do that? Probably not. Mr. Jones, this is Dan Mars, XYZ Securities. Man, I got a really good investment for you. Yeah, it's a, it's a management company, a closed-end management company. Yeah, it's called XYZ Investors. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you... Okay, yeah, I'll send you a prospectus on it. And, uh, okay, so two days later, phone rings. Yeah, okay, great, great, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put in $100,000 for you. I'll do that right now, and we'll buy it on the initial public offering. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Six months later, the phone rings. Hello, this is Dan Mars, XYZ Securities. Oh, hi, Mr. Jones. How you doing? Oh, I need to raise some cash, huh? Want to sell some of those uh, those those closed-in investment company shares we bought about six months ago? Oh, I'm I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, I can't do that for you. <laughs> well, well, that's because I have a Series Six license, and you see, I can sell those on the initial public offering, but then from there on out, they're just like a regular stock, and so my licensing won't allow me to get you out of it. Well, yes, sir, I did get you into something that I can't get you out of. 
yes sir, my manager's name and phone number, <laughs> it's, that's what you're going to be up against. So just uh, like I said, you can do it. Probably not a good business decision to do so. All right, so further open-ended investment uh, company characteristics, they're established by a sponsor, a primary underwriter, distributor, those, those names are all interchangeable, so a little acronym SPUD. Okay, a sponsor, a primary underwriter, distributor, and again, just use those, inter those names interchangeably. Marketed through a dealer network, in some cases, and this is the, uh, you know, may very well be the, the situation you're in, where uh, if you're going to get paid a commission on it, then you're, you're going to be going through a dealer network. You are one of those dealers. Now, there has to be a written agreement with a broker-dealer and the spot. All right, so the two have to have, it has to be in writing. And what happens is that the d distributor gets paid an underwriting concession, the dealer is paid the sales concession, and the total of those two equals the sales charge. So now this is something where I want you to read your question carefully because there's a strong probability you're going to see a question on this, okay? Basically, here's the stack of dollar bills that you've got to pay to buy a share. Most of that is going to be the net asset value. Part of it is going to be the sales charge. This total is going to be the public offering price. Okay? Now, if we take this part and blow it up, here's what we get. We have a certain portion of it goes to the underwriter as the underwriter's concession and the bulk of it goes to your broker-dealer as the selling concession. And the thing about that is, what are we talking about here? This whole thing is the sales charge. Now, a question that I've seen many, many times is that you have a situation where there is a, there is a uh, uh, net asset value of $10, let's say, okay? There's a sales charge of 7%, and there's an underwriter's concession of 1.5%. So, excuse me. Yeah, so, uh, so basically, you know, what you want to do is you've got to, you've got to say, you know, how much does the person pay? Well, the easy thing to do, okay, in fact, really, this is the better way to do it. $9.15. That's more likely what you're going to see. One of the answers on there is going to be 10 bucks. It's wrong. Because let's see, if I had 8.5% of 10 bucks, that's 85 cents. Okay, so I'd have a $10 public offering price, and then give me the nine fifty. dollars oh, but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, what am I doing? I'm double dipping if I use this. Because, see, I've got a sales charge of 7%, and that's all that the customer's going to pay. Oh, by the way, quite coincidentally, the underwriter's concession is 1.5%, but does the customer care who gets what out of that 7%? No, couldn't care less. So this is going to be somewhere around 995-ish. 998, call it. Yeah, probably around 998-ish. Okay. See if there's not a, a figure that's pretty close to 998. And we can do the math, whatever. But uh, but you know, just eyeball it first. Just the, like I say, this underwriter's concession, that's in there to throw you off. Don't let it because that's just a component of the sales charge. All right. So anyway, that's, like I said, I've seen that question just time and again. Read your questions carefully. Okay. All right, so let's see. Where are we? Okay, mark through a dealer network, the underwriter's concession, sales concession, the total of those two equals the sales charge. So down on the bottom of page 13, you also have uh, funds that are marketed directly to the public by the SPUD, okay, the sponsor, the primary underwriter, the distributor, and those are no-load funds. Now, the thing is, in order to have a no-load fund, they have to have no sales charge or load, so 0% there. 
you know how people are, they try to get in the back door and there are no back doors in the whole industry. So the, so the FINRA said, look, if you're going to call yourself a no-load fund, the most you can charge on a distribution fee, and we'll talk about those in much more detail later on, okay, is, is 25 basis points. Remember, 100 basis points equals 1%, so 25 basis points is a quarter of a percent annually. So that's the maximum you can charge and call yourself a no-load fund. So basically, what the deal is, let's just go ahead and, uh, uh, and, and draw these out. You know? Here's the situation that you're in. There's the fund. There's the spud, the broker dealer, and there's the customer. The customer is always going to pay public offering price. Fund is always going to get net asset value. The difference between the two is going to be the sales charge. Okay? So in this case, what happens is that the, the selling concession goes to the broker-dealer and the underwriter's concession goes to the spot. You could also have a situation like this where the customer contacts the distributor directly, but guess what? They're still going to pay public offering price. And guess what? The fund is still going to get net asset value. Therefore, the SPUD is going to get the entire sales charge. Or you could have this situation where the fund markets directly to the customer And in that case, the money goes back that way. Well, the fund always gets the NAV, and the customer always gets the, uh, the pays the public offering price. But in this case, there's nobody to pay in between there and there. So that's a no-load fund. Okay. So those are the three situations that you have with those. So anyway, we have... Um, yeah, let's go ahead and, and uh, we've hit kind of a, a breaking point here at the bottom of page 13. So let's go ahead and take a quick little break and then we'll, uh, we'll come back and pick up with the investment advisor and uh, some of the other uh, parties that, uh, that are players in the same.